Aloha Transpac race fans. Welcome to day nine of the 2021 Transpac. I'm Dobbs Davis, technical editor with Seahorse Magazine, giving you a little bit of uh, stories from the race course, a little analysis, and uh, in, a little, uh, in a little while we'll talk a little bit about scoring and how that works in this race. Um, but the lead story is final approach. Who's coming in to the finish? How far are they? When are they going to arrive? What does it look like? So uh, the, remember, this is a four-hour delay tracker here. So what you're seeing is, is four hours ago. Um, but I think uh, just looking at the wind fields here and uh, from this description of the fantastic race conditions that are out there, you, you know they're coming in fast. Um, in fact, one other feature of this uh, system, the YV tracker, is the ability to toggle over to a different tracker. So. Uh, when boats get within 200 nautical miles of the finish line, this uh, puts them on the live tracker, which uh, reloading that brings us to a new view. Oh, here we go. I looked at this a few minutes ago and um, the boats weren't on there, but now we see them. So let's, let's have a look. This is uh, new for me as well. And uh, who is it out here? Well, we know who they are. It's uh, Ho'okolohe. Where are they? Which one are they? There they are. And it looks like they've finally been passed by Piwacket. Uh, Piwacket is 170.8 nautical miles out. And this is real time, or real time to within 15 minutes. This is refreshed, I believe, every 15 minutes. Uh, you can get it more often, but it costs a whole lot more. So race organizers uh, reckon 15-minute skeds were... We're good enough in the live mode. Um, and uh, Cecil Rossi, Cecil and Allison are out here in their boat. They've got a mixed team of Californians and Hawaiians. Uh, they're, they're, how far are they? 171.9 miles. So uh, they're not exactly close. Now um, we can blow, uh, blow this in a little bit closer. There we go. Uh, remember the scale is down here. Uh, let me collapse this window now, actually. There we go. Uh, the scale is down here in the left corner. That's 30 nautical miles. So just looking at that, they're about 25 miles separated for sure. So they're, they're for sure not within sight of each other. Uh, both of them, let's look at their tracks. We can uh, turn that on. Oh, actually, no, turning that on doesn't help us because they've only now come into in, the, in that range so they probably don't have any tracks because there hasn't been more than one sked. Uh, in any case, um, they, uh, I know the Piwacket is sailing much hotter angles. They're on uh, Port Jibe, so they're, they're probably coming in in an approach like this. We can, we can look at that uh, on the other tracker view. Uh, whereas um, the FAR 57 is a boat that can sail at much broader, uh, deeper apparent wind angles, so they're going more straight downwind. So Piwacket will, uh, on this trajectory, like, uh, likely come in here. They, uh, I don't think anybody usually comes in close to Maui. They'll take a jibe out to stay in this really strong breeze. And I can, I can attest to this breeze. Uh, I flew in just today, and it is blowing out there. there there's big waves, big seas, lots of white caps, and uh, the clouds are building up on the, on the windward side. Of Oahu, in fact, it, it, it looks like lenticular clouds is blowing that hard. It's just, uh, it's really amazing conditions out here. So uh, everybody's coming in fast. Uh, in fact, how fast are they going? Well, uh, the Piwacket's showing 20.5 knots, plenty fast. Uh, I know that they've been probably going faster at times, uh, in and out of waves, and it's got to be a full fire hose as well. I mean, the reports are that this is a Quite a wet ride. Remember, the apparent wind angle for these guys going at this speed is about 60 degrees. So uh, it's uh, it's like high speed reaching rather than running, um, and they're just uh, really going fast. Now, like I said the other day, they're not jiving on every little shift out here either. Um, they're making so much of their own wind uh, at this speed that uh, you know navigator Peter Eisler has to figure out. Okay, it takes 20 minutes to jibe. How many do we want to throw in here before making the final approach into Diamond Head here at the finish? Um, you know, it's it's going to be uh, well. They got to finish on starboard, so uh, probably two and in maybe. Uh, maybe they'll have another one. We'll see. Uh, 
maybe the crew will have some input on that. In any case, um, it certainly looks like uh, these guys are heading straight to the barn. Uh, now, their ETA is going to be tomorrow morning. Uh, I think we did some math earlier. They're looking like a, a beautiful uh, uh, sunrise finish, which uh, at Diamond Head is just spectacular. Um, whereas the Piwacket guys, I think, will be getting in between 1 and 2 in the morning here in Hawaii time. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly look forward to seeing them when they get in. Uh, fantastic ride uh, for that team, and, and we congratulate them all. And again, that's if nothing happens. It, it, you know, this, this Molokai channel here, uh, as you can see, is, is blowing up. Remember, our wind scale is down here. So 28, uh, maybe, you know, could be 28 to 30 knots of wind here. Um, uh, with the Piwacket team, they're, that's a round-the-world boat of Volvo 70 and uh, uh, certainly built for those conditions. But as more and more boats come into this, uh, they, they could have quite, uh, quite, quite the acceleration of the breeze coming into the channel. The, the waves get a little funny as well. Uh, hopefully nobody uh, uh, has any disasters this far into the race, but but that'll be an exciting finish for, for everybody. All right, now let's go back out to our normal tracker and you get a sense of the of the bigger picture. Okay, here we are. Uh, so weather models are holding strong for uh, continued uh, big high pressure up here in the north. It's... Uh, Influencing the isobars, compressing them nicely so that everybody is uh, really having um, great conditions here. It's, it's really an ideal race. Uh, those tropical storm elements that we saw earlier in the week uh, that were down here, they're really not a factor. They're too far south. I don't think it's going to have any influence uh, on the weather. Um, let's uh, zoom in a little bit and... Just look at the fleet here. Everybody's intermixed. These are all three days of starters uh, that are coming in. Um, uh, the fastest ones from the last day have been overtaking the, uh, the Friday starters, <clears throat> who in turn have been overtaking the Tuesday starters. Uh, the crowns are, uh, as we know, the, the, those folks that are leading in corrected time. Uh, I will explain in a moment what that means. So uh, same, same characters here as yesterday, Warrior 1. Uh, the Brett Walda now, but you can see obviously a lot more jibes now. They're they're really playing the shifts here. They're trying every time you jibe, you know, you have a chance to cut down the distance uh, more to the mark. That's the whole uh, tactical elements and the geometry of, of sailboat racing. Upwind and downwind is is uh, staying on the favored jibe simply cuts down the distance um, to your objective. So uh, they'll be playing shifts. Uh, they can jibe a lot more readily than than Piwacket does. Uh, who's out here? That's Lucky. Now, Lucky, we think, um, what are they? Well, again, this is a four-hour delay, but it's possible for them to, to finish uh, tomorrow afternoon in daylight hours. Uh, that's the big Udall Rolex 72. Uh, they're rolling along pretty fast. Seven, 17 knots is, uh, is impressive. Uh, so um, a daytime finish, we think, for them tomorrow afternoon. That'll be great. Uh, and then there'll be a little bit of a time, time gap until tomorrow night. We'll start seeing the TP-52s or PAC-52s like Warrior One uh, and some of the others. Uh, this is Macondo. This is a Tuesday starter, a slower boat. Um, and uh, th so they won't get there as fast as some of these others. But uh, they may be a Saturday finisher. But there's going to be a whole lot of boats finishing Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be uh, really quite busy uh, here in Waikiki. Um, Pilagrosos now uh, leading in uh, Division Two, uh, so uh, they look like they're taking a pretty long. They're not jibing that much. You can see a pretty long, uh, a long uh, jibe on starboard to uh, probably position themselves up here. This is kind of the classic arc coming in. You get north of the rum line on final approach, come in on port, and then decide when to jibe back to starboard for the finish. So it's either one in, one and in, or maybe uh, a few and in. It just depends on on the uh, the shifts and the squalls out here. Um, and uh, here's Grand Illusion. They were leading yesterday, still doing quite well and speeding up. I mean, 14 knots is is, is really good for a Santa Cruz 70. Um, they, uh, they they're a long narrow boat, so they really sail different kind of angles than the high speed TP 52s. The TPs will sail, uh, and you can you can note this by their jibe angles. Note uh, they're more uh, uh, 
more acute angles um, than you see on the uh, the long narrow boats like sleds or the traditional heavier boats like Macondo. Uh, they they can sail at true wind angles of let's say 160, 170, um, whereas the faster boats sail at 150s uh, or maybe even maybe even less because their BMG is is uh, so much influenced by their own boat speed through the water. So these boats that are uh, a little slower back here, you're going to see just different angles in their jibes and different geometries. Um, okay, so uh, who else? We've got somebody else in the background here. Oh, Horizon, right, okay. They've, uh, look at that, they've overtaken the Triumph. They were, um, they were uh, behind Triumph in the earlier skeds, 13 miles behind them. And now in this sked, or at least in this four-hour sked, uh, four-hour delayed sked. They are um, uh, they pulled ahead of Triumph and have now taken the crown. We got a nice long report from them uh, earlier today on, on what their um, adventures were last night. That's going to be in our, our press release that you'll see, um, which we'll have to update now that uh, they've actually taken taken the lead away from Triumph. So congrats to them. Uh, and and listen, it's highly competitive. All these guys are really working hard. They know the end is in sight, and uh, everybody's going to going to push for it. Uh, there's Favonius. Uh, they are Division 7 leaders. I think they were uh, yesterday as well. So anyway, uh, you, you all can per, um, peruse this at your leisure and uh, keep keep track of this. And, and really, the, 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 uh, the excitement's going to come in the next, excuse me, in the next couple of days uh, as everybody makes their final approach. Now, how does, how does this scoring work? Um, I'll... Uh, uh, alert you to this. This this is a big complicated matrix and just a wall of numbers. Uh, I'm going to try to try to explain what it means. Uh, in in the uh, VPP based rating system, the ORR that's used for this race, uh, the uh, the way it works is that um, it's a measurement based rule, and the rig and the sails and the boats are all measured, and all aspects of of the boats uh, uh, are measured, including the crew weight. Believe it or not and the stability of the boat, and these are all factored into what's called a VPP, a Velocity Prediction Program. And the VPP predicts the speed of the boat at all these ranges of wind speeds, 6 knots up to 24 knots, and from 0 degrees to 180 degrees, true wind angle. Uh, and so the, the prediction of the boat's speed can then be used uh, to calculate the rating based on this scoring model. So um, just to, and, and, and this scoring model is something that is, uh, has been devised by the Transpac Yacht Club along with uh, Jim Teeters at ORR, and they've been tweaking this model for um, many years. They, they figure they've got it pretty well refined, um, and, uh, and it's supposed to represent what a Transpac race is you know, what the actual conditions are out there in the course based on years of observations. Um, and so this matrix obviously would have a heavy weighting uh, in uh, these broader angles. You don't see, so the numbers are very low up here at the upwind VMG angles, you know, 25, 30, 35 degrees true wind angle, uh, 40, 45 degrees. The numbers aren't very large. There's not a whole lot of uh, upwind uh, work in this, uh, in this race. Um, if you were trying to model uh, a Fastnet race or a Middle Sea race or, or Sydney Hobart, it would be a very different um, uh, matrix than this one. This is a, and, and, the, and they're able to do this because the conditions in Transpac have been historically, uh, you know, fairly stable, right? I mean, uh, everybody knows it's a, a short beat followed by a reach, then followed by a run. Um, now there's obviously some variations depending on the weather, and it varies year to year. But but looking at it, looking at it over many years, they've been able to devise this uh, this fairly accurate model. So um, this is and where is this? This is in the appendix of the notice of race uh, for this race, um, and it's released back in April when the first NOR was uh, was was released and published. So this gives everybody an idea of well. You know what? What is the performance envelopes of the boat? What is sorry? What is the rated performance uh, of these boats? And um, and then you can also you know do some uh, do some studies. And I think the 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 Transpac uh, Yacht Club probably does this 
uh, is review, you know, how did, how did, it, how did we do on the matrix? How, you know, what were the conditions like this time? Did it uh, fairly replicate uh, what we have in the matrix? Uh, and, uh, and, and does it need tweaking? And, and anyway, so this is a, this is a great way to try to um, really uh, come in at a, at a, uh, a model that, that is fair because it's not just a random, you know, uh, throw at the dartboard. This is really targeted toward what this race is about. And with a VPP-based system, you can do this. And, and then what, what's done with this is it compresses all these numbers down into a single number time-on-time -time rating. So that way, uh, each boat's uh, corrected time will simply be a, an equation of the uh, of the uh, TCC. We call it time correction time correction uh, uh, coefficient uh, multiplied by the elapsed time. So boats with a higher TCC are faster. Uh, multiplied by elapsed time, they get a very uh, high high number. Uh, whereas boats that are slower will have a very low TCC, and when multiplied by elapsed time, that will result in a lower number. And in the end, it ends up balancing out. So that's how we're able to get close results if the model is right, and the measurements are right, and the VPP is right, right uh, we get good, good, close, fair racing. That's why, it, certainly in my opinion, VPP-based rating systems are, are certainly the way to go, and, and Transpac's been, uh, uh, been doing this for many years. So um, that's uh, our technical explanation for uh, tonight's show. I'll go back to the tracker because uh, it's a lot um, prettier than looking at a big wall of numbers. But I hope that helps uh, answer some questions about how all this works. Uh, and then tomorrow's show, I hope we'll have some, some of these, uh, well, we will have a few of these uh, trackers parked at the dock uh, here in the uh, Alawai or in the case of Piwacket over in Honolulu Harbor. Um, and more and more that are making final approach and more and more that we can uh, switch over to the live uh, version. So thanks for tuning in, folks. Um, for our Day 9 report, I'm going to sign off for now, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. I'm Dobbs Davis for Seahorse Magazine.